This is papyrus. It's a font loved by some, hated by others. And this is also papyrus. But unlike the font, this papyrus is beloved by just about everyone who's ever encountered him in the multi-award winning indie darling Undertale. And so do I. Despite its simplistic 8-bit presentation, I rank Undertale as one of the most emotionally impactful experiences I've ever had in any media. Books, games, movies, TV, any media. Suffice it to say, I love Undertale. So today I will be sculpting the Great Papyrus from the game Undertale in my own semi-realistic style, of course. Now, because Papyrus is a skeleton and I want to put him in a running, leaping pose, I'm going to replace one of the legs with a steel wire instead of aluminum. I'm pretty sure this isn't actually needed needed, especially if I reinforce the leg with epoxy, but I was feeling a little anxious about whether the sculpture could survive an impact in case I drop it or had to transport it later, so you can think of this more as a security blanket wire than structural. Now that we have an understructure, we can get into building the shapes. For me, what's interesting about this project, other than that I love the subject matter, is that I have to make choices. When all you have is this jumble of pixels as your guide, you have to make choices about how things are going to actually be translated into reality. In this case, Papyrus wears an oversized round chest and shoulder armor, gloves, and again, oversized boots. He appears to be wearing black tights according to the smaller walk-around sprites and other official and semi-official Undertale artwork. So for me, the big decision is whether or not to embellish these designs and make a really realistic version of this armor where I fully design how it can be taken on and off, how the shoulder pads are attached and articulated, how the boots are laced, etc., etc. Ultimately, I decided not to over embellish the designs into a hyper realistic papyrus because that's not how I picture him. When I'm playing Undertale, I don't imagine these characters as some hyper detailed version in my mind. I just see the characters as they are, pixels and all. For me, it doesn't make them less believable, it's just how they're presented. So I'm keeping it simple this time around, and I kind of love it. In the game, Papyrus makes you a bowl of spaghetti, and I'm kind of imagining how he would act if he thinks that he's made the greatest bowl of spaghetti that there ever has been. Next step is going to be refining the model, but before we do that, let me take a moment to talk about this video's sponsor, BetterHelp. If you've been watching my videos for any length of time, you know that I'm not afraid to talk about struggles in the artistic pursuits from both craft and mental standpoints. But sometimes I find an art problem is actually a life problem. When this happens, it can be helpful to talk to a therapist. Therapy is a safe place where you can share what's on your mind, whether it's stress, sadness, worry, relationship issues, all without fear of judgment. A therapist is there to listen, ask questions, and help you see things from new perspectives. They can provide insights and teach techniques to manage emotions, reduce stress, and make positive changes in your life. And BetterHelp is a platform where therapists and their clients can communicate effectively and get the most out of therapy. Starting is easy. You just fill out a questionnaire and you will match with a therapist in as little as a couple of days. They carefully make sure therapists on the platform are well qualified and their customer support team is there to help if you have any questions. With over 7,000 reviews and a 4.5 rating on Trustpilot, BetterHelp is a platform you can trust. If you are struggling and you think you'd benefit from a therapy session, click the link in the description or go to betterhelp.com slash artchongart and get 10% off your first month of therapy. Okay, and now back to the project. Now that we've got the basic shapes down, it is time to refine the sculpture, starting with the head. And I'm basically going to just start over with this because I kind of rushed the mock-up and the proportions was pretty far off from where I wanted it. Sometimes you're just better off starting over if the basics are too far off. As I said previously, I'm not going for realistic Papyrus. But to get more specific, I'm picturing what Papyrus would look like if Undertale was adapted into an animated movie or TV series. Maybe something like Pixar's Coco or something like a studios would make. Low-key, I'm also drawing some tiny bits of personal inspiration from the old LucasArts title, Grim Fandango. And if you get that reference, congratulations! You are old! 
Another reason I wanted to go with a cartoonier skull is because I want this face to be able to display emotion like the in-game character. In this case, I want pure, unadulterated joy. It is the face of someone who believes, as I said, that he has indeed cooked the greatest bowl of spaghetti that there ever has been. I love this stage of sculpting where you're taking the kind of rough and lumpy mock-up and shaping it into something that's hopefully as good as and sometimes even better than what you had imagined. But in practical terms, much of this step is just taking a handful of sculpting tools and scraping the crap out of the sculpture. It really is unfortunate that one of the funnest and most satisfying part of sculpting is also the most boring to watch. If you are an artist or maker yourself, you probably already know in some way, shape, or form what this is like, but still, I wish I could truly show you how it feels to watch a sculpture transform in your very hands. It's not all scrape-scrape, of course. The boots, for example, need some serious shaping to get the wrinkles right. I probably could have gone with bigger wrinkles for a cartoonier look, but I don't mind these. I think they do a good job of conveying his size and the force with which he is running with joy. Same for the scarf. I love sculpting cloth, especially scarves. They're flowy, fun to shape, and look really cool once you get the shapes down. Again, I could have gone with thicker folds for a cartoonier look or even a heavier fabric. That's how you control the apparent thickness of fabric, by the way, in case you are a beginner artist and could use the tip. Thicker and fewer folds and wrinkles imply heavier fabrics, so you can adjust that quality to create the look that you want. In my case, I probably could have gone with like 30% fewer folds, but that's okay. Again, I don't mind these at all. And that's the first round of shape refinements done. Can you tell the difference? I sure hope so, otherwise this is kind of a giant waste of effort. Anyway, from here, there are a bunch of little but important things I need to do. First, I need to add a second tail to the scarf because scarves have two ends. But more importantly, I made the scarf tails removable to make life a little easier during painting. You'll see how this works in a second. Really, I could have and possibly should have made the entire scarf removable, but it's really not necessary because the scarf collar isn't going to get in the way like the tails will. If I made the collar removable, it would save me time on masking the part, but then I'd also have to spend time making it removable here. You see, it comes off like that. Next, I add the trimmings to his gloves and shoulder pads and added his shorts, speedo, superman pants. This is one of those things that I have to make a choice on. So again, I kept it simple and went with a slightly armored or structured superman pants. Little details like the fasteners on his boots and the little symbols on his chest plate will wrap up the main body. You might have noticed I carved into the model first before applying these details. This is not strictly necessary, but I find it can be helpful to have a little groove around the embossed detail for extra visual contrast. It worked a little better for the boots than for the chest symbols in this particular case. Lastly, we can snip off the support wire on the front foot and clean up the opening with some epoxy clay and that's the main body done. And now we need to just wrap up the accessories, that being the fork, which was easy enough. I intentionally left this very rough looking. I'm hoping that these will look like rough beaten metal by the time I'm done painting it, but we'll see how this works out during painting. As for the plate or bowl, uh, is it a plate or a bowl? I don't know, it's kind of somewhere between the two. Anyway, I made a rough little bowl out of clay, baked it so that it will have some stability, then sanded it back down. There are lots of ways to make a bowl, and to be honest, I only made mine this way because I first made the plate as a mock-up and baked it on a whim and didn't want to start over. I did put the bowl on my turntable to kind of sort of shaped it like actual pottery for no reason than I thought it was silly and fun to try. If you have ever considered trying real pottery, by the way, I think it's great. I took a few classes a few years back and have a few bowls in my kitchen to show for it. 
For the spaghetti noodles, I'm pushing some clay through an extruder and squiggling them onto the bowl. I went with translucent clay because I wanted to try tinting the noodles the right color during painting instead of painting painting it. We'll see how this works out during painting as well. I will make the sauce for this later during painting, but for now we're just gonna go with the noodles. And that's it, at least for the sculpting anyway. For once, a piece that I was hoping to be fun and quick actually is fun and quick, so hooray for that. And here he is again, all primed up and ready to paint, so I guess we should just get right to it. We're gonna start with the black limbs and white armor. I'm gonna give the black parts some subtle highlights and the white parts some subtle shading, just to keep it from looking flat. I do still want it to read as black and white, just also with a little bit of dimension. Secretly, I'm also testing out a new idea. During the sculpting stage, I actually left the armor not quite as smooth as I would normally make something like this. I basically skipped the final sanding and refining stage because I wanted to see how a more textured finish would look on a painted model. And I'm a little mixed on it. There is something nice about the piece having some texture that clearly indicates, hey, this is a handmade sculpture rather than a perfectly smooth finish that emulates like a factory finish, for example. But also I think the idea needs further exploration. I think if I'm gonna leave texturing on the model, maybe I need to be a bit more intentional about what kind of texture is present. So further experimentation will be required. For the red parts, I'm pre-shading with a dark red, followed by a bright candy apple red. Again, it's all about giving dimension and contrast to areas which otherwise wouldn't have any. Following the main red coat, I'm going to try out a new material for recess shading, that being Tamiya Weathering Master. It's kind of like using pastel powders, but more controlled. They come in these almost like makeup compacts, and the texture is somewhere between a paste and a powder. This works really well, actually. Easy to apply, very forgiving to mistakes because it just cleans up with water. The color palette seems unfortunately somewhat limited since it's made specifically for weathering effects, but I really like it, and I'm looking forward to seeing what else I can do with it in the future. For his Superman pants, I decided to just hand paint this part. I'm experimenting with how it would look if I went with a roughly blended blue instead of airbrushing with very smooth transitions. And as it turns out, I don't mind this look. The big benefit is that it's a lot less stressful for me personally to just paint with a brush than to mask and spray with an airbrush. There are certainly pros and cons to both methods, but I guess the bigger point is that a simpler piece like this is a great chance to experiment with new techniques. So that's why you're seeing me try a bunch of new techniques or ideas on this piece. The gold trimming is just gold. This was a choice that I had to make actually because in game and in most artworks of Papyrus, you see these bands as just plain yellow. So I could have gone with plain yellow and that would have been fine, but I felt like the gold would add just that little bit of extra pop for this piece and I'm really glad I went with it. Somewhere in the middle of all this, I also painted the little badge on his chest and lace on his boots. Little details like this getting painted really help the piece feel complete to my eyes. And as usual, I'm showing you the process in a slightly different order than how it happened in real life. The recess shading on the boots, for example, actually happened after I painted everything else on the body. I just thought it fit better next to the red paint section. For the face, I first painted the whole thing black because, well, I just felt like it was a pretty good starting point. Then I mask off all the parts where I want it to be completely black, followed by a coat of off-white. I'm trying to not completely fill every nook and cranny with white paint in this step. I still want some of that black to show in the recesses. Next, I emphasize those recesses with more Weathering Master stuff. I don't really know what to call this. Is it a powder? A pigment? Oh, whatever. Anyway, I seal off the weathering master under some varnish, then apply some oil washes to bring back the definition on Papyrus's teeth, and that's gonna be it for the head. 
All right, now for the accessories. For the fork, I went with a dark metallic that Vallejo calls oily steel, and it worked great. I think the dark metal color works really well for the roughly sculpted fork. For the bowl, I first paint the whole thing kind of an ivory, off-white color, followed by some tan shading just to give it a little bit of dimension. Also, maybe Papyrus uses artisanal ceramics in his kitchen. Who knows? The spaghetti itself gets a tint of yellow, red, and brown because I first tried yellow and didn't quite like it, so I kept messing with it until I felt like it was the right shade. I'm figuring this out as I go, guys. I hope that's obvious. You don't need to know everything there is to know about clay sculpting to make something fun and interesting for yourself at home. For the sauce, I'm going to start by sanding down some foam. Huh? Yes, because I need to simulate ground beef, and I figured this would probably come close, and I had some spare foam lying around. Anyway, I tint the beef kind of a red-brown and mixed it into some polyurethane varnish with a touch more tomato red for good measure, then on to the noodles it goes. To top it all off, we are going to head back to the sandpaper to get some sawdust because we need a little Parmesan cheese to finish off this little lump of meaty goodness. And that is it for the model. Now we are going to need to make a simple base to put it on. I start out by routing out a circle in a sheet of MDF and cut that circle with a little border around it. Then I use that same circle to trace out another circle and roughly cut it out with a jigsaw, then glued the two pieces together and flush trimming the lip with a trim router. This is definitely overcomplicating the project, but I secretly harbor a desire to be a hobbyist woodworker, so I'm trying to sneak in a little practice just for fun. Once I have this base, I'm going to cover the indent in the middle with some clay and carve in the kitchen tiles. That's really it for this base, just some kitchen tiles. I didn't really want to overcomplicate the piece any more than I already have, and besides, where else is Papyrus supposed to cook spaghetti? A good bake later and we can paint this thing orange and brown, which is the canonical color of Papyrus's kitchen as far as I know. There is a case to be made for changing the tile colors to white or gray instead because that would make the boots stand out more. But in this case, I went with the lower accurate kitchen tiles because, I don't know, it just felt right. But I could see it going the other way for sure. A little bit of dark brown wash between the tiles is going to complete the look and we can drill a new mounting hole for the model. Which means it is time for final assembly. And when I do that final assembly, it looks a little something like this. And that is it for my semi-realistic but not realistic at all papyrus. I certainly had a lot of fun with this one, even though or perhaps because it is in such a different style from my usual work. But what do you guys think? If you're an Undertale fan, do you think I've captured the essence of papyrus in this piece? Thank you to all my patrons who support me on Patreon.com. I appreciate you guys so much for believing in me. And welcome to new members, Leonie Albrecht, Emmanuel Xu, Pepito, Kentrick, and a special thank you to Jay Garris for being a Patron of the Arts tier supporter. If you like the work that I do and would like to throw a little support my way, or if you're interested in polymer clay sculpting and would like to learn how to do what I do, Patreon is by far the best way to do that. And lastly, thank you very much for watching. I hope you get to make something one day that you are as proud of as Papyrus is of this bowl of spaghetti. That's it for this one. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.